Connecting to dreams are important because it's connecting to you. <laughs> Remember how little you know. You're just a curious monkey after all. So welcome back to Curious Monkeys. I'm here in my home in the Amazon and today we have a very special episode. My friend and teacher, uh, Tricar. Tricar is a dream guide. Uh, she teaches people how to connect with dreams and how to explore this realm of consciousness. And also a death doula, a person that holds the space and guides people in the process of dying. So this conversation is about dreams and death. Two things apparently separated, but very connected. Uh, you are going to learn a lot about the practice side of it, how to keep your diary, how to connect with your dreams, how to do it. And also we will explore the importance of thinking, um, having death present in order to have a, a better life. I met Tree in London many years ago, attending one of her workshops, and this was a life-changing experience uh, because I learned a lot of tools and I learned a lot of insights that I ended up sharing here in the Amazon in, at Psychonauta Foundation, where sometimes we do dietas and ma with master plants and ayahuasca, and this dream work is being very helpful for people and very related to the work with the plants. So thank you, Tree. <laughs> Also, this recording was the genesis of this solution. It was filmed many years ago. You will see that I have different hair and I like look younger. And I also, you, you will see that I'm very awkward in camera <laughs> because this was actually my first time ever in front of a camera. And it's part of a bigger project, a documentary with her, that I finally can get my hands on it because I just recovered the files and it will be appearing very soon uh, in this channel. So three, I'm waiting for you here in the Amazon. I send you a lot of love. And for the rest of you, please pay attention because what we're talking about here is really important. Why people don't, don't talk about dreams in the normal, in the normal life? <laughs> I know, it's funny, isn't it? And I notice sometimes when you do talk about dreams or you say, I had a dream about you last night or you mentioned a dream, people get, some people get a bit weirded out by it. Like, I don't want to know. Like this is a very strange uh, reaction to speaking about dreams sometimes. Sometimes people get, uh, feel a bit vulnerable or they feel um, like slightly, um, some people feel slightly superstitious. Oh, too, you know, speaking about their dreams. Oh, if I speak about it, will it happen? Um, but I think for the most part, people don't really connect with their dreams anymore because as a society, we're very disconnected from our inner worlds because there's such huge emphasis on the external. Um, and you can see countless examples of it with the... Um, with consumerism, with modern industrialized Western culture and, and, and people feel like they need these external things. And so often the internal worlds get completely like bypassed. So a lot of people feel like they can't access them. Um, it's almost like we've lost the art of accessing our dreams. Why is that important? Well, I think it's important to, to be engaged in your inner worlds. It's really important. That's kind of where the real work gets done. If you think of us, if you, I'll use the analogy of artists. So before an artist makes a work of art into the external world, they are in the inner world, using their imagination, accessing visual content, and then sketching it out into a sketchbook or whatever their medium is. So it's, it seems as though the inner, the inner process is really important. Um, for creation, for making things happen, for bringing things into our reality. Um, yeah, so I think mm. that's the um, inner worlds are important. Connecting to dreams are important because it's connecting to you. It's connecting to your, uh, your subconscious realms. It's also connecting to your, your consciousness in a different way as you sleep. 
Uh, so a lot of people just shrug off their dreams because they don't think it's important. Like loads of people just think it's just junk data. It's just your, your brain just putting different puzzles from things you've seen throughout the day. It's nonsense. It's gibberish. It's, uh, there's, no, um, there's no real function. It's just the brain doing its, uh, doing its dance as you sleep. Mm. But I think, um, you know, unfortunately... It's kind of sad to have that that point of that point of view of thinking that dreams are just are just that just junk, because there's so much more. There's so much more to to dreams um, than just junk. And you can there's countless examples of, of of amazing things that are brought into this um, into this reality because they were first conceived through dreams. So huge feats in science. Um, creative works, um, mathematical formulations, you, know, you name it. Um, the realms of dreams are, are, are important, are mm. important realms. Yeah, it's, it's curious that you say that we consider this a uh, junk when, I don't remember how many years are, but it's like how many years we spend sleeping. It's like, it's like calling 20, 25 years of our life junk. It's like it's, it's calling that, that part of your life is junk. It's like it's, yeah, right? it's crazy. It is, it is, yeah, it is. And it's kind of like an opportunity, 25 years to, to kind of get stuff done and to explore. Because mm -hmm. I see dreams as an exploration of your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I don't see them as junk. I see them as important. It's your consciousness. You might not be aware while you're sleeping, but that doesn't mean that you're not conscious. Because when, consciousness is like your awareness of your perception of the, your environment around you. And it, it could be any type of environment. It could be um, um, it could be a psychedelic environment. Mm. It could be a coma. It could be an altered state of consciousness that's still valid. Um, and it feels as though, um, you know, that, that's kind of not, it's not taken seriously because it's just, oh, it's just a dream. Mm. But no, it's a valid form of consciousness because your perception is having emotions. There's senses. There's, mm. there's all of these things going on that deem it as part of your consciousness. So I see dreams as just an extension, just an exploration of your consciousness. And you can go deep with it. And you can, you can explore for 25 years if, if you're blessed to live that long, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. 25 years to explore that consciousness. It, it looks like uh, in this consumerism, um, action-oriented society that is all external and it's all there this this looks like a, is being ignored but this was not always like this is not uh, no can you do you do you have any more examples of maybe a, a, as you say like some people that uh, use dreams to get into inspiration from art or even science or or even ancient civilizations that they use dreams in a different way right yeah so um yeah, dreams were taken more seriously, it seems, in the past. So, you know, um, leaders and kings and tribe chiefs, they would consult the seers or the dreamers within their, their group or their tribe or society in order to, to give them guidance to help. So it was considered, you know, quite a, a good role to have. Um, and it was an important role to have to make that connection for guidance to bridge over into your waking life to get things done. And I think um, when it comes to creative process, um, it, it's, a, it's an amazing sort of uh, space in which you can kind of create, get inspiration and create. So no matter what your, what your talents or your innate gifts are, so you could be a designer or you could be a musician or you could be a software developer, it doesn't even have to be anything creative. You could be like a hard science mm. person or into biology or, you know, and you can use your dreams in order to problem solve and work things out and gain inspiration. So how do you get there? How, do, you know, how do you get there? That's, that's the question, right? Because you have people like Einstein who had dreams about, you know, that help, um, help bridge the way for them to create new formulas. Um, how did he get there? How, how do some of these brilliant minds get there? Well, they got there because they took to dream. They, they believed their dreams, and they mm. took their dreams to be serious. They had a sensitivity towards their inner realms, 
and the quietness within themselves. Um, so it all starts with intent, you know, just opening up the book of, of dreams within yourself and just say, I'm, I'm going to take my dreams seriously. I'm going to start actually listening to them and connecting with them. So that's where it starts. The very first thing is intent. I'm going to explore my dreams and I'm going to go deeper into the realms of my dreams. It's not just junk. <laughs> mm, yeah. so There's a whole sea of consciousness and uh, magic there. Sometimes even you are reading a book and then mention dreams in the book or you watch a film about books or you talk about uh, with a friend about dreams and that actually changed the experience that you had that night is like it becomes like a, you are a bit more conscious about it or more you know like just by mentioning that just by talking about with dreams about uh, with people or something like that so can you for the people that don't know how to connect maybe can you explain how did you get to the, your connection with your dreams in your life and then maybe how how you teach this yeah so i um I've always felt really connected to my dreams since I was a little kid. And actually, like, my first memories were dreams, not anything that happened in, like, this concrete waking reality. So that always left impression on me, was having my first memories or were in dream space. Um, I think the reason why I was so connected to dreams as a kid was because I lived in a very... Um, sort of sheltered environment mm. as a kid. I lived in a communal setting. Um, we didn't have, this is the seventies. So there was no, there was no distractions like the internet or mobile phones. Um, I grew up in a home with like no television and there was no, it was all reading and making artwork and playing and making music. So I think because of that, I was able to sort of have a really deep and quiet inner world and that's probably why I was so connected to my mm. dreams a lot more um, when you when you do things like spend a lot of time in nature make artwork read write reflect it just becomes this seamless undulating dream in itself mm. the process because you're working from your inner worlds out into the external, back into the internal, out into the external. And this is kind of how, what dream work is like. Um, so I guess I was doing that quite a bit as a kid because I didn't have any of that external stuff that was demanding my attention mm. and keeping me kind of cut off from the, in, the inner worlds. Um, I think so it's probably that and probably maybe like I probably have the disposition to dream as well. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, uh, like on the Meyer Meyer Briggs personality types, I'm an INFJ, which is like an introvert, and so uh, I'm very internal, and um, my sense, my intuition is quite um, peaked. So it could be that's how I process things is through an internal sort of landscape. Mm. So it could be just you know personality disposition as well. It'd be interesting to do studies to see what. Uh, uh, Meyer Briggs personality types, which ones dream more than the others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that would work. <laughs> but I think that's probably what set me up for a, a lifetime of dreaming. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, what happened after all these years exploring your, exploring your, your dreams, then you decide to, to share this with people and, and, and guide them? Maybe, maybe, how, how did you make that change? Yeah, so how did I make the, the, the bridge over from being an introverted dreamer, exactly. dream journaling for years, just keeping dreams kind of to mm. myself, to connecting with people in my external world and come, stepping out as a dreaming guide? Okay, so basically, <laughs> it's going to be so funny, but a plant told me to do it. Mm. <laughs> So I, I work a lot with plants and I had been doing a lot of work with um, ayahuasca. And so I was having one particular journey with ayahuasca and basically the plant consciousness showed me my dream journals, like a really clear vision of my dream journal entries and very clearly said, you need to share these dream journal entries online, like on Facebook. Um, and I thought, 
of you know having this conversation with this plant consciousness. <laughs> I'm like, why would I want to do that? I like to keep things to myself. I'm an introvert, and also, isn't that a bit egoic? Mm -hmm. Like, why would anyone want to see my dreams? And you know, so I'm having this uh, kind yeah. of argument with her. <laughs> <laughs> It's Just, good is that the plant is uh, asking you to post things in Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> she's, 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 post, she's a bit like that. <laughs> post your dreams on Facebook. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, th this, this is really weird. I am so not like, uh, pay attention to me, guys, type yeah. of person when it comes to stuff like that. So as I'm having this like little argument with her, she starts to show me like all these golden souls coming in. She shows me the process, like I'm getting visions of, my images of dream journal entries on Facebook. And then this vision of all these golden souls coming in towards me. And then, and then the plant consciousness saying, you're going to help these people and you need to do this. Mm. And it hit me so strongly. Like at my heart just like burst right wide open. And I just trusted it. And I said, I believe you like, because I felt mm. it, And it wasn't because it was just a vision. I felt it. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it was beyond just the vision yeah. and beyond the, hey, you got to do this. It was energetic mm -hmm. and the feeling was so boundary dissolving and expansive. And also the feeling of unity and you're going to help people. Like this mm -hmm. is important work. So that's that was basically how it how it happened so i did it i, I started posting my I, I'm, i'm glad you did because i was one of one of these souls that found found your your post and your worship in in facebook and in social media and that's that's how i end up meeting you and having this one i don't know if it was the first one or the second one of the first worship you did if, yeah. if i don't remember so yes yeah yeah continue please so and, and, tell me, and, tell, and tell me what happens inside the, the the worships as well yeah so so then yeah, so i started to post things up and sure enough people were getting in touch so i, I was basically that was my initiation hmm. was with ayahuasca she initiated me into dream work i mean i was already doing dream work she initiated she, sorry she initiated me into being a dreaming guide mm -hmm. and so i stepped out And so as soon as I started posting, sure enough, people were messaging me. They were sending me private messages saying, oh my God, I had experiences like this. And how do you lucid dream? And 101 questions about dreams. Or can you interpret this dream? What do you think it means? And I was so amazed. I was like, wow. So this went on for quite a while. And it came to a point where I just thought, I'm answering so many messages. I might as well just do a workshop and then everyone can be in the same room and then I can just say, Hey, <laughs> let's talk dreams. And so that's kind of how the workshop was conceived was because yeah. um, it, it evolved really quickly, really quickly. And that's how I, um, then I, I, I formed that group, mm -hmm. the, the weekly group that you partook in. And the reason why I formed that was because I had a dream that told me to do that. <laughs> and I was even given like a peacock feather yes. and, and, and was given the name for the group. Yeah, I have, <laughs> I have it in my home. And, and, and what do, I mean, how, how do people feel and react and how, 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 what happens inside these this worships of dream cycle circles? Or, so or yeah, so in the workshops, I, I, I don't want it to be all like a, like a, a um, I don't want the workshops to be like a talking point with like a slideshow and a yeah, PowerPoint. Yeah. That's what I meant. Didn't want it to be like a PowerPoint. Hmm. I want it to be really human. Hmm. And I wanted it to uh, embody the same energy that was coming my way when Ayahuasca initiated me into this dreaming guide work and what I felt when I saw them and felt the golden souls coming in. Hmm. So it sounds so like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a science fiction novel, right? The golden souls mm. came flying in. Um, so I wanted the workshops to kind of be an extension of that. So my workshops are really informal. And so I form a circle um, and everyone sits in a circle and we open the workshop with everyone sharing a dream. And the reason why I do this is to 
connect us all together as dreamers, to collect us as vulnerable humans who all dream and just sort of get it all out in the open. And as we're sharing, we all realize that, hey, we're all, we're all the same. We've all had like the teeth falling out dream. We've all been chased in our dreams. Mm. Some of us have had the flying dream. And, you know, we realize no matter what our gender is, whatever our culture or our spiritual belief system is, it doesn't matter. We all collectively share very similar things in the dream state. And so I want to establish that when I first open up a workshop, because by the time we finish the end of the circle, everyone's like, <sighs> Exactly. That's how I said, that's exactly how I felt. I remember the first day. <laughs> I mean, I was there. I know you need to, to um, I think you asked, like, do you remember any, any dream recently? Because we did not start yet to, to do all the journals. And, and I start to sweat, like, oh my God, I need to share my dreams now in front of the people. <laughs> What's going to happen? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and, and it was like a kind of really, I was really anxious about it, uh, but then as soon you talk about it and you put it out and you see the rest of the people doing the same, yeah, it's a relief. And it's like, wow, it's like, and then this realization is like, why, why don't do this in our, in our daily lives? Why are, are we are, why we are not talking about these amazing realities that we have every night that we all share? And we're talking about uh, stories that we read in magazines and, yeah. and, 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 you know, like and something that, um, I mean, we, uh, with, the, with the weeks, uh, then you start to connect with these people in a different way. You don't connect through this reality. You are sharing other space and, and you create connections with people. And you know, like, I did not have a, uh, I, did, I was not contacting these people in my in real life. It was like every Thursday we were there. And, but as soon as you get there, you were a kind of family. and. If we all talk about this, maybe we can we we will realize that we are all this this big family. I don't know. I don't know why you connect in a different way. Yeah. Do you feel that? Or? I do, and I find dreams and dream sharing in this way. I do it in the circles. It's boundary dissolving. Exactly. That's, it it that's, dissolves that's boundaries, and you can see it in people's you know hmm. expression afterwards. Everyone gets really relaxed hmm. and they're like, oh, we're all kind of the same. But another important thing that I want to sort of bring into that picture is the fact that we are all part of the collective unconscious. Mm. We are all part of the same dream. This waking reality, this experience that we're having here on planet Earth in a way is like a collective dream. And so we're all part of it. So having the, the opportunity to share that way also bridges that sort of mm. gap it makes people realize that we are part of something bigger. We are part of a collective and we're part of something greater. And it's almost like, I love dreams because they are like little psychedelic experiences Definitely. that you have every night. Definitely. No, and free. They're, and they're for free. <laughs> and you, do, it's not like, yeah. you know, it's, we have the ability every night to go on these really amazing soul journeys or however you want to, frame it but it's um they're like mini psychedelic experience so you know with psychedelics you know there's a lot of information online mm. about psychedelics the the benefits of psychedelics how it's like expansion you know um, boundary dissolving it expands your consciousness it, it makes you see outside of the box it makes you feel one with everything it heals depression you know i could go on and on about the benefits of psychedelics but no one talks about dreams yeah. that way and dreams are an innate part of you and you don't even need to like, you know, smoke anything for it or drink anything mm -hmm. for it or chew anything for it. You just have to have simply have the intent that you're going to journey that way every night and get something out of it and um, evolve your consciousness through it or be inspired by it. So it, it's funny that something that's free, something that's natural and something that's innate is not given... Mm -hmm as much importance yeah. as something like psychedelics and believe me i've had really yeah. and i'm sure you can yeah. attest I, I know, psychedelic no, the, the, experiences the is like in the dream state it's not it's not only me i think everybody has this at least this dream that wow that that was weird even the most reductionistic materialistic guy has that dream oh that was crazy 
So I think in a way it says it says it all about our mindset and about our society. You know, like by having this amazing experience, and we are almost like the Pavlov dogs. Every every morning with the alarm clock, we program ourselves to forget about it. Like why yeah. would, why why we forget about it? And what can we do? We will go after more details, but you know, like why that happens? Why we have this am amnesia? Not every morning and, and um, yeah what what can we do to yeah why do we have it because it's as simple because we're told they're not important mm -hmm. we live in a society that tells us that they're not important yeah have you ever noticed the way that our society uses the word dream it was, yeah it's 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 all for the external yeah an American I dream thing. of having a big car I dream of a perfect supermodel wife I dream of you mm. know an amazing career. I dream of being a pop star. The American Society, dream. <laughs> yeah, the American dream. Like dreams have been, hmm. you know, transformed into something that means something complete, <laughs> something mm, completely yeah. different. So, you know, when it's context, the reason why is because of conditioning and we're conditioned to externally dream. Is your work to and do that, to undo that programming that society puts in your brain. 100%, is that is absolutely. that what you do in in your in your circles? Yeah, basically relearn everything that you've been taught. Hmm. That's great. <laughs> relearn everything you've been taught. Always look at it through a different lens if you can. I mean, it's difficult at first to look at things through a different lens. But question everything that you've been, that you're told on television, that you're told through your education system. I mean, I, the, the, your biggest teacher is nature. It really is. Everything you need is there in the natural world. That's a, a good example. A good example is, is, is nature. Um, think of health and fitness. You know, when, when you get ill, your doctors like take these antibiotics. And we just believe, oh, that's the way you do things. And people almost have a fear of nature. Like, oh, I'm not going to take those weird mm. herbs to cure my, to help with my cold. Why am I going to take those weird herbs and put mm. them in a hot water? That's just a bit dodgy, man. Like, that's weird. It's like, <laughs> this is what you're from. <laughs> yeah. But we've trusted things like Big Pharma and, mm. you know, th th this sort of system. And, and we all just sort of blindly go, yeah, okay, we, we trust it. Um, it's a simplification, you know, you, you just... Constantly observe and question. You don't take things at face value. Um, but I always say look to nature because nature is an amazing teacher. Um, and um, we've, even, we've even been ta taught in our society to fear nature in so many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, like look at just people like screaming when they see a, a spider walk across the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or nature is there to fear, to fear it or to use it, abuse it, is for the human use. Even things like Christian uh, or Christian background uh, tell us that the paradise is not this one that came after yeah. and all this stuff, so we are twisted. And this is new, it's, it's like, it's a couple of, I don't know, it's, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that before, so. Yeah, no, it's true, and, and everyone's looking to, to get to that other place <clears> and no one's actually here. Um, so when you start doing your dream work, one thing I want to say about dream work, becoming a dreamer, um, becoming a dreamer more connected to your dreams is not an escape. Mm -hmm. You're not escaping this reality. That's what, that's what a lot of people, uh, say, ah, no, this is for, you know, like just, yeah. just escapism is, is one of the things that and our society goes, oh, he's a dreamer. She's a dreamer. Yeah, Dream yeah. on. Like there's a sort of, um, it's seen in a negative way, like you're out to lunch, you're, you're an escapist, mm. you're a dreamer, you know, all, so all those connotations. But when you really start engaging in a conscious dreaming practice and really start doing the dream work, you're very much here. It's not an escape from your waking reality to just go into these blissful dream realms and you're lucid dreaming and flying around and mm. swimming in waterfalls. It's, no, you're very much here. You're here on earth because you're meant to be here. You work with your dreams in order to bridge through the information and all the guidance and all the creative 
aspirations and everything that you need to know into your waking reality. Eventually, the two become, it becomes seamless. So you see the synchronicities and you see the, the messages and the language of everything and the symbology of the universe. It, it's ever flowing from dream to waking reality, back into dream to waking reality. It becomes a steady stream of consciousness. Um, and there's no real difference in the end. I mean, sure, there is a difference because you have the, the laws of physics. You can't just uh, go up on this roof of my house and go, okay, uh, this is great. Let's fly now. I'm going to fly. And then, you know, of course, I'm not going to be able to fly. Um, but I mean, more of your, your consciousness and your perception when it comes to um, the inner material relating to your external world. Um, and creating and, and making things and soul growth and healing, you name it. So, yeah, so dreaming and doing a dreaming practice is not escape from this world. It's to basically to better this world in a lot of ways. And you can do that, you know, through this practice. Mm -hmm. um, it makes you very, very lucid when you're living. It makes you live more consciously. Um, so it's... Um, in effect to be it's part of this whole part of being a human being and part of being a part of this planet definitely it's um, natural it's totally <laughs> natural and, and, and how do you, and how do you start to deprogram somebody uh, yeah when you, when you <laughs> it's hard to deprogram <laughs> yeah you can but it's difficult especially you know what's really difficult is like little kids right hmm. you're being programmed since you're a little child it's very difficult to to change the program when you're older. So I work with people who are, I work with kids. Mm. I work with people who are senior citizens. Mm. And the senior citizens have a real hard time you know, deprogramming. Okay. But I got to say, like, I've been guiding one man end of life, like, for the last two years. And he's felt differences. Mm. So in two years, he's really shifted his perception and his consciousness of his reality and that's um you know he's 65 so it can it can be done but i think children it's it's a lot easier um but you know we have all this whole generation growing up with like smartphones everyone's addicted to their phones and we got a whole new like yeah it, it know, can be it could, could be even 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 worse the rise of ADHD and all this sort of, so I mean, it's like, um, it's almost built into people now. It's mm. becoming, we're evolving in so many <laughs> weird ways. <laughs> so you, you mentioned intent as the most, most important thing and maybe the first step to maybe actually say to yourself, okay, dreams are important and I'm going to pay attention. Something as simple as that you will, is, is, is the first step. Yeah. And how, how, in a nutshell, how, how do you con continue from there? So it all starts with intent. So going back to nature again, it all starts with a seed. Hmm. So you put a little seed in, in the earth and with the intent that I want this to grow. So that's how all it, all it takes is uh, putting in the seed of intent. I want to dream. I want to activate my dream realms. Bring it on. <laughs> and then, um, then after that, what do you do with the seed? You water it. So that's another, you give it sunshine, you, you, you nurture it. So you don't just set the intent and go, okay, I set the intent. I should be able to be like connected to my dreams every night. Oh, come on, let's bring it on. <laughs> you need to practice this. Yeah, like yeah, that. you need to water it. You need to water it, cultivate it, give it some love, give it some sunshine. So there's a lot of self-care hmm. when it comes to a conscious dreaming practice. There's a lot of care with your body, your mind. You know, there's, there's, there's care going on. So um, uh, the next thing you want to do is just have a look at... So one of the first things you want to start doing is, is look at how are you disconnecting from yourself. So there could be habits or things that you're doing during the day, every day, um, that disconnect you from inside, like your deep, quiet, inner reflective nature. Um, so it could be too much time watching Netflix. So it could be like you're on your phone too much or... You're endlessly stressing or worrying too much. So you might want to cut down on a lot of, you know, time on your electronic devices. That helps a lot. 
Um, you might want to look at lifestyle factors, like what are you doing with your body and your health that might be making you disconnected from your inner mm. realms. So it could be like, are you drinking too much caffeine and you're constantly, you know, up there? Or are you, you know, inebriated, like drinking too much alcohol and disconnected that way? Or you're smoking loads of weed? No, I'm not trying to say that you need to be mm. like a total teetotal when you're doing a conscious dreaming practice. But I just think everything in moderation. Mm. Like if you're feeling like, I can't, I don't dream at all, but then you have like a cannabis ha habit, it's like, well, that's the reason why, because mm. cannabis totally suppresses dreams. Um, again, you know, with caffeine, if you're drinking like loads of coffee, you're not having proper sleep cycle because it's being disrupted because you're, you know, full of adrenaline. Um, you know, there could be things, it could be diet as well. Sometimes diet and, and food, uh, certain foods can really affect um, your dream, your sleep and your dream. So having an overall look at your habits, have an overlook at your lifestyle, and also have a look at what your sleep hygiene is like. So sleep hygiene is um, everything that you do during the day that might affect your quality of sleep. So we're meant to get seven to nine hours of sleep every night as adults. That's kind of like the, the healthy amount of time. Um, but often a lot of us shortchange ourselves and we don't get that much sleep. Mm. And therefore that, that creates a disconnect from our dreams and our sleep cycles. So you want to make sure, you know, we don't, we sleep for, you know, 25 years yeah. on average. That's 25 years of dreaming, 25 years of sleeping. Yet we never invest in like a decent bed. Like some of us are sleeping in really shitty yeah. beds. And <laughs> or our bedrooms are just like a right state. So it's like, you know, cleaning up your sleep hygiene, making sure that your bedroom is conducive to good sleep, therefore good dreams. Mm. And it's a, it's a form of self-care. Get yourself like... A nice comfortable bed you're gonna be in a bed longer than you're ever gonna be in driving a car you know this is like a really Im a huge important aspect of, mm. of life um, get like the best bedding you know like just breathable mm. uh, cotton what I know it sounds I sound like such a mom here wash your bedding every yeah. week but no these things makes, you makes know, they, they, they affect your sleeping make sure that your room's not too hot or too cold or the air is fresh or recycled and you know, you get the clutter out of your room. Um, basically, I say to people, if it doesn't have anything to do with sleep, dreaming, or sex, just get it out of the room. Mm. <laughs> so, like, yes. get out the clutter, get out the television, get the television yeah, out of the bedroom. Of Don't have a big flat screen and be watching that the last thing you go to bed or yeah, or, 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 or even or even keeping the TV on while, while you're sleeping. sleeping. Lots of people do that. Um, Also, people working on their laptop the la in their bed just before they go to sleep. Mm. All these things are going to create a huge disconnect from your inner worlds and therefore a huge disconnect from your dreams. So it's, there's a real like you got to do an overhaul, mm. you know, overhaul of your habits and really be disciplined and really like make a commitment to do it. It's kind of like going to the gym, right? It's like, you mm. okay, you want a six pack. It's like. Well, you got to put the work in, you know. <laughs> It's not just the intent. <laughs> yeah, you don't just go, I want a six pack. Wow. Yeah. Um, you put the work in. So the conscious dreaming practice, it's like, it's a discipline. Mm. It's a practice. Um, you commit yourself to it and you try to stay on course. What happens is you, you do start connecting to your dreams. They become more meaningful, more vivid. You remember them more. And even you become lucid. You even mm. get to the point where you're having lucid dreams um, on a regular basis hmm. so those are kind of um, yeah it's a real devoted practice there's a lot of different aspects to sort of overhaul in your life you also want to do things during the day so it's not just stuff that you're doing around bedtime um, and it's not just your diet and your your consumption of too much technology There's also a mindset. So you want to be having more mindful moments throughout the day. You want to have mindful moments with intent. So there's, an, there's a, like a practice that you're doing throughout the day. So there are moments of just, you know, 
you stop getting off your phone and you start actually, you say you're on the train, you, you get off your phone and you actually look out the window of the train, of the moving landscape, and you really take it in. It's like and a you'd be very present with mi it. Mi kind of mindful, mindful, mindfulness or being present in the moment. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it's mindfulness and being present, but with the with intent, with intent and yeah. you're doing it several times a day as a practice. So you're having intent several times a day. Oh, I'm on my commute, right? I'm going to take 10 minutes out of this commute. It could be even longer hmm. to just really take in the atmosphere and just really like, There's some hills, there's some sheep. I'm really taking in my environment. Um, it could be on your lunch break, you're looking at the apple you're about to eat and you just you don't just scoff it down. You really look at it and you're really aware of it. So you you it's part of the mindful intent is that you you observe, you sense, you analyze and you contemplate. So it's not just your, your brain is actually quite engaged, mm. but it's just on that one fo focusing on that one scene or that object. And you're really taking it in and you're really like, it's red and where do apples come from? And, you know, really taking it in. Um, what happens is when you do this several times through the day w with intent and mindful intent, is that you train your consciousness, train your brain and your consciousness to be very present and very aware of finer details and very focused. And so if you're doing that many times during the day, you find that it translates over into your dream realms. Mm. So you'll be having a dream and you uh, are walking in the dream and you find a flower and you pick it up and then you're and your dream self is really looking at this flower. And then all of a sudden you develop, you become conscious within the dream. Mm. So you therefore become lucid because you've been practicing it that throughout the day um, with intent that you were going to, you know, at several points during the day, really pull your present awareness in and really take in your environment, analyze it, contemplate it, observe it um, with, with, with amazing detail. This translates into the dream state. Um, and you find that you live, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're li living, your waking living is lucid, and then your dreams are lucid, mm. you know? And, and once the people start to adopt these practices, what transformation do you see in the people or what experience uh, share? Yeah, so I've seen like, I've, I've guided dreamers that have had like really great breakthroughs. That has been amazing. Like, The, the best thing in the world is when someone sends you an email and they've told you that they've had their first lucid dream. Mm. It's just like, yay! Like, it's so good. It feels yeah. so rewarding. It's like, it's amazing. And, and I feel so happy for them because it is, it is such a, a poignant experience because you realize your consciousness is so much more than we're told it is. It, it's so it's much really more. Important. It's yeah. so important. How, how do you describe a lucid dream? How, how would you describe it to a lucid dream is, well, it, I can tell you how it feels. Mm -hmm. It feels euphoric. It feels magical. It feels joyous. Um, it feels boundary dissolving. A lucid dream is where you become conscious and aware within a dream. So you're in a dream and something happens like a pink elephant walks across the road and then you're watching it and you go, wait a minute, that shouldn't be happening. This We, oh, this is a dream. And then mm. you realize that you're in a dream. What happens is as soon as you are aware that you're dreaming within the dream state, your present awareness becomes very engaged in the dream environment. The energy shifts. You get this euphoric kind of rush that, that usually wakes dreamers up out of their sleep mm. because it's so like, wow, it's like it's a eureka moment. It's like you're struck by a lightning bolt and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. I, And, it, and it's more real than real. So it's so vivid that you feel like your senses are more heightened and mm. more shy, uh, your, your senses are more finely tuned than they would be in this waking reality. So for example, my vision gets, uh, I have amazing 2020 vision. It's like my vision, I can see such detail and such clarity mm. and I can see beyond mm you know, what our normal vision could see in this, in this 3D reality. Vision gets heightened. Your sense of, um, your senses get heightened. 
uh, tactile touch, smell, like all the feelings, all the senses are heightened in, in, into a vivid sort of reality. It almost feels as though, like it feels like it can, it can be like a psychedelic experience um, because it's so hyper real. Mm. It also feels a bit like, um, some people would say it's like a spiritual experience because it's such an epiphany. And the energy is very sublime. It's really interesting, the energy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you're, you're awake. Mm -hmm. And you can get that, in, in, you can get that in, in waking reality, where you have moments where you go, yeah. I'm awake, yeah, I'm alive. Yeah. Like my consciousness is so, like, I'm so connected to it right now. Mm. I've had moments like that, just what, like looking at a sunset. Mm, yeah where i was just so blown away by the sunset and like there's no it's almost like there was no boundary between me and the sunset it was like i was the sunset experiencing mm. itself mm -hmm. and that's the boundary dissolving yeah. context of like a lucid dream yeah but you can get it in waking yeah. reality too I mean, but also like is, is what you were saying about your practice you know like once you're you, you, you have this as a practice and you are doing this mindful intent uh, uh, and have a, a continue to do it in, in dreams, then it's, you know, like it's, you, you are programming yourself to have that more and more and more and more. So you are more, it's like you are en enhancing your perception in a way. Absolutely. Yeah, because it becomes a practice, you do yeah. training and you, you become, um, we're connected. You're, you're like, I get it. It's like riding a bicycle. You're like, yes, I get it. Yeah. I, okay, I get it. Um, a big part of the practice is journaling and record keeping. Mm. It's like the most important thing because if you're if you're an explorer and you're going on a journey, you need to be taking. You need to be making mm. the map as you go yeah. along, right? And a dream journal, and you map out all your dreams. This is your map. This is the map to your subconscious realms. This is the map to all the clues of how you're going to navigate this, you know, this life here um, and your waking reality, all the clues that you need. So yeah, you need to dream journal. That's like the biggest, most important thing. And I always encourage people, like if you're not into like writing, you know, because sometimes it yeah. takes a lot of time, you wake up, you're like, oh, I'm so tired. Yes, <laughs> you can record your voice speaking your dream. Mm. You can type, you know, you can text it to yourself. You could take it in notes. You can video record yourself reciting the dreams. But this is the most important thing because when you get it from out of here into this waking reality, you can look at it and then you can start navigating it. Mm -hmm. And also a big part of it is sharing the dreams. Mm -hmm. So having a friend that is like your dream, your dreaming partner, friend, buddy, whatever you want to call it, bouncing off your, your dreams with them as a sounding board, it can be amazing. Mm. That's when it gets really interesting is when you start um, connecting to other dreamers yeah. and then you start navigating dreams together and you start navigating the collective unconscious yeah. together because often their dreams will help you too. Yeah. So, I mean, we're exactly. talking like this is not individualistic. Mm. I'm a dreamer. I'm a one or not. I'm a lucid dreamer. This is my mission. This is my thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we're all in this together. Yeah. It's a collective. So I, I actively work with other dreamers. So we start off with our individualistic practice because I, I want to emphasize that this is not a selfish practice. Mm -hmm. This isn't like, oh, me and my dreams and my, you know, my rituals and mm -hmm. my amazing dreams and my lucid dreams, whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not about that. It's about everybody. And so once you start moving from your, your practice to connecting with other dreamers and your practice, well, big part of the practice is it includes other dreamers. So mm -hmm. you have your, your little dream tribe. You have your core group of dreamers that you collect, you share with them. And what ends up happening is th their dreams and your dreams help each other. Um, so it's not an individualistic practice. Mm -hmm. It's a collective practice. But we got to start with ourselves. We got to start with do, knowing how to do the work with ourselves and then branch out and start doing dream work with other dreamers. And they, that's when it gets really interesting. That's when it starts evolving in a deeper and more expansive kind of way. Um, and that's when it gets really trippy too because mm, you end yeah, up having yeah. mutual dreams, sharing dream space. You're both having the same dream, same dream symbols, um, 
same experiences. And sometimes it, it can happen quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it happens quickly and within the group that we did and it happened quite quickly is like, because we were all devoted and committed to the practice. Mm -hmm. Everyone was doing their practice at home. And also because we had all come together with an intent as well yeah. to do this work together and share, it happened quite quickly where people were ended up having mutual dreams, the same shared dreams. And I've noticed this too when I do retreats. And the retreat's like two or three nights and then the same thing happens. Yeah. Where people end up having mutual and shared dreams and everyone is, ends up in each other's dreams. <clears throat> and the cool thing with that is every person's dreams speaks to the other person, like mm -hmm. helps the other person in some kind of way. So, so it seems as though it's um, an innate ability that human beings have in order to help each other, mm -hmm. in order to guide us through this waking reality, making decisions, helping heal other members of our tribe, yeah. um, giving uh, a helping hand, yeah. um, pulling together collectively with an idea and go, yeah, that's, yeah. I dreamt that too. And then you go, yeah. let's follow that. That seems like an idea. Mm. And it's difficult to understand because it's not, it's not something intellectual. It works more with the intuition, intuition. And, you know, like once you start to talk, you know, like you, 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 you pick up messages even from other people's dreams that help you realize about, you know, like about your own dreams or about your own life. And when you start to share your dream and somebody tells you, no, if that was my dream, for me, this will mean that thing that maybe you never saw about that. But it's like all it all takes another another dimension. Yes, right? it does. And and it really needs to be approached like with no ego. Hmm. Like at all, you know, like you need to be willing to hear someone else's dream about you. Mm -hmm. Some people get their back up. Mm -hmm. You dreamt about me? What? <laughs> like, why? You know, and, but it's, a, it, it, you know, it's good to be able to like put that ego aside and mm -hmm. just, and to, and to listen to this and realize that we're all in this together. So if there's any competitiveness when it comes to, the dreaming practice, like, well, I do this and this formula yeah. works. Well, I I follow this dream. Th there is a bit or... of that in the lucid dreaming world, right? A bit yeah, of... yeah, there is. There's a lot of that. And there's also like, but it's like, guys, it's not a competition. Yeah. Consciousness expansion is not a competition. Mm. It's not individualistic. It's collective. Mm. We are all collectively expanding our consciousness. We are all collectively evolving it's not one person doing it if one person ascends we all ascend with them so that's another construct of our western mm -hmm. industrialized capitalist consumerist mindset is that i'm an individual it's all about, it's me, about me and i'm in competition with every other fucker out there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, until my until until I get to my grave and nothing of that or nothing of that is going to matter. <laughs> There's that, or they get close to the grave and they're like, "What the fuck was yeah. it all for? And who am I? What was that? Where, what's my story?" And, you know. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's not about you. Hmm. It never was about you. Hmm. People find that hard to hear. Yeah. This is not about you. Yeah. And this is not about me. This is about us. It's, it's, it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear at the beginning, of course, because we're programmed like that. But if you think about it, it's the most empowering thing ever. Because if it's not about me, it means that I'm part of something bigger than me. Yeah. So and I find a lot of inspiration there and empowerment. And this is one of the messages I want to get across with this project. Like, like in the moment that life is not about you, that's not bad. It's better. It is good. At first, it, it hurt people feel the pain of the mm. death of the ego. Mm. You know, some people go kicking and screaming. They mm. have proper death rows. Mm. I don't want to die. I don't want my ego to die. You know, this is me. I'm a rock star mm. or I'm this or I'm a, a judge, a lawyer, a nurse, a doctor, whatever the story is. And people find it really hard when it's when the ego is dying. Mm. But then after it's gone, when it's lesser, 
you're like, whew, actually, <laughs> it feels pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's just like, it's kind of like uh, I've never had, I've never given birth to a child, but I'm just mm. getting back to like a, a nature as a metaphor. It's like a woman in la labor pains, you know? Mm. It's the, the pain, the pain of it happening, the pain of the baby coming out. Mm. And then once the baby's out and you're holding the baby, it's just like, you know, mm. it, the process, there was pain in the process w with a beautiful result. And the death of the ego is very much the same. It mm. feels like very painful process. Mm -hmm. And, but the result is like, oh, actually I'm off the hook in so many ways. We're doing this together. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is a lot of competition and mm. there's a lot of competition in any scene, but yeah, even in the dream scene, mm. yeah. even in the dream scene where it's like, yeah. You know, there's a lot, especially as a as a girl in the dream scene, because it's like very like male mm -hmm. sort of dominated. But most of the world is male. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo most of the patriarchy is. But um, most uh, spiritual teachers and like mentors and guides and things mm -hmm. are, you know, mostly men in the scene. And so there's a <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot of competition. But again, that's conditioning, and you can you don't have to compete. Mm, yeah. But I always just say to people like. Don't worry, there's no, it's not a competition. And especially like people who are really feeling like, oh, damn, I haven't lucid dream yeah. yet. And I've been trying to lucid dream for like three years or I haven't had a lucid dream in a long time. And they get really down on themselves about not being able to achieve a lucid dream. And then they see that the friend posts on Instagram, mm. had an amazing lucid dream last time. And they're like, oh, fuck you, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> fuck him. Fuck yeah, him. it like, happens. See, it's not a competition. But, uh, but I think it's, it's it's part of the process as well. I, you know, like um, the lucid dreaming world in a way is like a big attractor where to something even better than the lucid dream. You know, like maybe you start there, but then you realize, oh no, it's about the practice. It's about it's this. It's about um, that. That's right. It's not about the lucid dream it's so much, but mm -hmm. everyone's so goal oriented in the society we live in. Mm -hmm. Also, everybody wants instant results. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like that get a six pack in one week kind of mentality. And People want the instant gratification mm. of, uh, you see it, like learn to lucid dream in 24 hours with my techniques <laughs> and, you know, all the gadgets people are putting on their head or they taking different pills and, you know, doing different things to kind of achieve the lucid dream because it's, it's very goal orientated mm. and competitive orientated. But they're losing sight of the practice in the bigger picture, which, is, which goes deeper and it's, it's so fulfilling. And the thing is about like with lucid dreams, when it's so rushed, like learn to lucid dream in 24 hours or a month. People will give it a go. Mm. It won't work. Mm. And then they get discouraged. Yeah. They get discouraged and they give up. The guy doesn't worry. Oh, it's not for me. And it's like, ah, mm. but that's, no, it is. And you know, the thing is the importance is all the dreams. So there's a lot of emphasis, especially in the, in the last, like maybe um, five to six years, really huge trend of mm. lucid dreaming and like it's a buzzword and everything and every mm. it, it's become super trendy i suppose yep. which is great because it's yeah, great that definitely. people are even knowing about yeah, these definitely. forms of consciousness in the dream state but what ended up happening is um everyone's focused on that and, and they don't realize like all the dreams are important mm. yeah. like there's so many t types of dreams but everyone wants the superstar like mm. amazing goal or orientated lucid dream but don't ignore all the other types of dreams that you're having. So you might be having recurring dreams or you might be having um, uh, compensatory dreams mm. or precognitive dreams or after death visitation dreams or symbolic dreams or even your nightmares or sleep paralysis. They're all there to tell you something, to teach you, to show you something mm. right in your face so you can, you can learn from it and, and, make changes in your waking life or use it as a roadmap to navigate your waking life. Mm. So all the dreams are important, not just the lucid dreams. Mm. Talking, talking about nightmares, you know, like when I was, when I was a kid, I slept with my mother every night until I was 10 or so, because I was so scared to go to sleep. I, I was having horrible nightmares, monster, aliens, I got it all, you know, like my mother, my father's they, they dying and my mother, she didn't know what to do in that, in that occasion. And I was like crying if I, if I was alone in my, in my bed, uh, I was scared. 
um, you know, my mother was sleeping with me all, all, all my life, but yeah. she, she didn't have the education. She didn't know what to do. If she was going to go to the doctor, uh, there was not answer. Like, no, this is just the kid. I mean, what I'm going to do with your kid? He's, he's a, 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 scared, a scared kid or blah, blah, blah. So I think then I start to tune in a bit into horror films and all of this as a kind of compen compensation of, uh, of that. And I heal myself in a way, but how, how could you help my mother in, yeah. in, that, in, that, in that situation? Yeah. Or, 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 and, and sorry, um, why nightmares are there? Why nightmares are important? How do you work with nightmares? So I'll answer your first question about like with how to help a parent who has a child who's having nightmaric episodes and they have fear mm. of going to sleep. Um, the most important thing um, to do with a child is to is to to validate their experience. So you're not just saying, "Oh, don't worry about it. It's just a dream. It's not real. The yeah. monster's not real." That's going to make the child compartmentalize the nightmare, and it gets put in a box. And that, when that happens, it just gets bigger and bigger and becomes mm. almost an obsession. Mm. That's right. So the best thing to do with um, navigating with children who have nightmares is to really listen to them. Because basically, it's an experience of their consciousness. Of course, you're saying the monster isn't real, but they've experienced something that felt so real. There's Their consciousness experienced this. So the best thing to do is just to listen to them and to just hear them out and just don't try to shut it down. They'll have emotions that are attacked, like fear. Fear is a big mm -hmm. one. Um, there's lots of fun things you can do with little kids to help them gain control, not, a sense of control over their nightmares. So they realize that they're not going to be hurt by these things that come. And there's some fun things you can do um, like you can craft, do lots of crafts. You can draw the child, draw the the the, the monster mm. and the nightmare. This helps bring it from outside of there and outside of the box mm. that doesn't want that doesn't want to be talked about into their waking reality sketch, and then talk about well, how, what would you do with that monster? How would you change it? How would you change the ending of your dream? And then they can draw another character. Oh, well, I'll transform him into a butterfly, and then he can draw that. Mm. So. Doing that process, you're like re-scripting the nightmare, but through the forms of drawing, or you could even like, um, one thing I like uh, doing is, is fun is just, is baking. So you can like, the, the child can like bake, make a shape out of dough, a cookie dough out of the monster and mm. bake the monster. And we're explaining like, this is the monster that you dream about. We're gonna bake him, and then at the end, you eat him. And mm. so what happens when you're eating him, it's like the child gains a sense of sort of, control but also like they're integrating mm. the fears like it's almost symbolic and didn't that taste good and then you know it these sort of little gestures and they're just like creative ones but it helps bridge it the, the nightmare content into their waking reality in a sense where the child is map literally mapping it out physically eating it drawing it changing the ending of it um and i know even for even smaller children who are like two, three years old, like very little, and they don't quite draw yet. And you could do a few of the baking things with them, but um, mm -hmm. some I know some parents do things where they have like just like a little spray of water in the room, and they'll label it monster spray. And they'll say every time before you go to sleep, we'll just spray the room with the monster spray. It's going to be okay. And so the child goes like the monsters aren't going to come, and they spray the room. Mm -hmm. This. And I know it sounds like, oh, don't be ridiculous. There is no monsters and it's just water. But what you're doing is you're, you're, the child is, is learning to set intents mm. in their room of this is, they can't quite ex understand that, that, that it's an extension of themselves. But through the act of like spraying the room going, I'm no monsters tonight, they're setting an intent. So you can't, it's very difficult to articulate what intent is for children saying, well, just say you're not going to have a nightmare and you won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to do like physical activities, like you do these little rituals and practices. And then they, you find that that builds their confidence. They, they are able to 
not be afraid as much and just create a ritual around bedtime that brings them uh, tremendous co comfort. But the fact that they can find, they can bring the power in themselves. So they don't need to be going into mom's bed all the time. I need mom, I need mom, mm. or I need dad, I need dad. It's like, no, I have power over this myself. So you're in, you're empowering the child by doing these little these little crafts. Now I have sort of like my own theory as to why certain children are more prone to nightmares. I mean, there's obvious things like if a child is spending countless hours playing video games, like mm. violent video games or watching violent content, often, yeah, that's gonna, they're taking mm. that in, that's gonna be a big part of their inner worlds too. But then some children don't, they, they, their parents. Yeah, I wasn't there. And you, you weren't. So my theory about children who have, um, if that's the case, they, they, are, they have a disposition for sensitivity. And they're, I often I see uh, kids who have clairvoyant abilities and very in touch with like sort of the realms beyond. They'll, be, they'll have a disposition to recurring nightmares, sleep paralysis, hmm. night terrors. And it's just because they're kind of closer and connected to the realms and it's a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Um, especially kids who start developing mediumship abilities. So often that nightmare content will come through, you know, like the other side, yeah. the, the dead, the, you know, and it, and it seems scary as a kid. Mm. Um, but if you have someone who can explain to, if you see that your child's developing uh, cog, um, clairvoyant mediumship or precognitive abilities and you could clock it and, yeah. and start working with them in a way where it's less scary. But that's a, that's a gift and it's an innate talent. So it's sort of like if you were in a tribe mm -hmm. growing up and you were having that night terrors and fears and scary dreams, the shaman would come and put, take you under his wing mm -hmm. and would guide you through working in those realms mm -hmm. and in the realms of your dreams because you showed the gift and the ability at a young age. Mm, yeah, so that's I... kind of my opinion when it comes to... But you do have to, you know, you do have to look at the child's life and situation. Like I said, mm. if they're, they got a steady diet of, yeah, no, I did that, I did that after. And horror films. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that's the thing. You know, for, for Often, me, for me, in a way, what I, how I navigate that experience is when, as I remember, like I think, uh, I end up having the ability of waking up from the not at the beginning, but you know, with time, is, I, I I learn how to. Snap! Uh, I was like even screaming, and I was waking up and like, okay, at least, at least uh, I could I could let the dream. I was when I was awake, I was really agitated and scared, but at least I was not screaming anymore. And that's that's something that I keep even until today. And sometimes it's 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 not good because it also happens when it's a, a very good thing. So, for example, I'm in a dream. And something amazing happened, and then it's like, oh no, this is this is a dream. This is not this is not happening. And I say, oh, and I wake up. I say, oh, I, I wanted to continue dreaming, but you know, like that's that's something that I, that I learned. And it's not that's not a lucid dreaming. I never I never had a lucid dreaming in purpose. I had, but yeah. I had one spontaneous one. But I had I can do that in purpose. You know, like yeah. I can realize that okay, this is scary now. I'm going to wake up. But I'm not, I'm not able to maintain myself in the, in the dream after that. Yeah, because in, with night, navigating nightmares, and you're in the nightmare and you realize, oh, this is a nightmare. Most people wake themselves up. Hmm. But what you could start doing is staying in the nightmare when you're, you realize this is a nightmare. And then hmm. you could go right into a lucid dream. And it's a great opportunity to, to, um, to actually interact and face the nightmare content hmm. and transcend it and move beyond the nightmare, because I believe nightmares are our biggest teachers. Hmm. So everyone wants right. everyone wants the lucid dreams, the fun stuff, yeah. but uh, like the most transformative stuff is the stuff in the shadows. Hmm. It's the nightmares. It's the sleep paralysis. It's the night terrors. It's the reoccur the recurring content too. Hmm. It's the biggest teachers because um, there's a lot of um, lessons in the shadows there's a lot to learn from the darkness and from the content the dark mm -hmm. material and i think they're dark gifts yeah nice 
and、mm. they're there to to teach to, you something, to show us something. Yeah, we never want it though. Everyone wants just like rainbows and unicorns and puppy dogs. Yeah, but, you know, but,、um, that's nice too. But I mean, there's the light and there's the dark. You, you get this, and you, you cannot you cannot grow if. If you don't pass through uncom- uncomfortable things, if you avoid it, Listen, you will never grow. Totally, you know. And do, being an end of life death doula,、mm-hmm. I see this at end of life. You know, no matter what, it's all going to come out. Like end of life, if you've been squishing it down all your life and you're not wanting to look at the dark gifts that are there and the dark material, it's going to come. It will come. In the in the last week of your life, the last unless you get hit by a truck and you didn't know, <laughs> but、yeah. you know when you're on your when you're on your deathbed,、yeah. you, it will all co- start shifting up, and then you'll be looking at it then. So why not be looking at it through your entire life as it comes up,、mm-hmm. and it comes up in dreams, and it comes up for you to look at. But I do have the theory that with children, so with a child who's having recurring nightmares. So if they're not if if they're seeing so a children child having reoccurring nightmares if they're not watching violent movies or video games and that's not the thing、um, if they're not sick health issues because sometimes you know you'll have nightmares because if you're poorly as a child you, maybe you're prone to infections you have fever dreams those、mm. give nightmares so the health health is a big one if all clues and signs point to a child、um, having sort of clairvoyant or Sensitive or mediumship or intuitive、um, abilities, then it's a gift. So basically, you know, it seems kind of nightmarish and like terrible. Like, why would anybody want that material?、Um, but it's there to actually help people. I know、mm. it sounds. It makes a lot of sense it, it because、helped. if if it was not hidden, it will it wouldn't be a reward. You know, like、uh, you need to, you need to do the step, and then you see, like, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad. It was, it was the monster was not a monster,、yeah. the ghost was not a ghost, the killer was not a killer. It was something, yeah, a gift. Yeah. Also, kids can, you know, if you have like sensitive intuition and abilities, children can pick up things that have happened in in like houses or rooms、mm. or places. So it could be, you know, the nightmare content could be connected to to that. It could be connected to the energetic imprint of the space、mm. of what happened in the past in that house or in that space.、Um, the thing is, you know, with horror films and everything, it's it's made these things seem so scary and freaky、mm. and supernatural and like, and because it's so overplayed, played out in films over and over in our media and our、mm. culture. People just look at it almost in a cliche kind of way, or they look at it like, "Oh my God, that's so scary! I can't, I don't even、yeah. want to know." But the thing is, I really believe that the supernatural is actually natural. Natural.、Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's it's not sup- super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just part of all of this. It's part of being human. Some of us are really sensitive and can pick up on stuff.、Mm. Some of us can talk to ancestors. Someone. Some of us can. See energy, some, and it's there to help people.、Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a reason and a purpose. It's not to be like a、um, like a famous spoon bender on a on a reality TV show or something. Like it's not for entertainment value. It's actually got like、mm-hmm. a purpose for the collective. So that would be my、um, my answer to you know、uh, as a child growing up and navigating it. Because I know you, I would say it's more of a sensitivity、mm-hmm. and, and more of、um, More to do with that, and when you're a child, it's hard to articulate all of that. But like I said, if you were born in a tr- in a tribe and you had the same、mm. thing, the shaman would take you under his wing. <laughs> That's a pity. And then you. you, you, you <laughs> and and talking about horror films, and you mentioned sleep paralysis. I'm I also I also had that all the time, and now I now now it's, it's a bit the same process. Now I'm actually looking forward to to have it when it happens. It's not scary, but please explain what is that、um, and how it feels and how can you face it. It's kind of a night. It's kind. Of, it's very similar to what you feel. It's a, it's a, it's a hyper nightmare. It's, yeah. It's, it's, how, 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 how yeah. How I like that it. word. It's a hyper nightmare. <laughs> it is. It's, it's yeah. Wow. Sleep paralysis. It's um. 
it's a dream state where your body is in complete paralysis. And this happens several times during your sleep, mm. sleep cycle. Our body goes into paralysis, a paralysis state so that we don't act out our dreams. So usually, you know, when we're in REM, we're completely paralyzed. Because if, if we weren't, we'd be a sleepwalker. And mm -hmm. so you do have that. Mm -hmm. um, people sleepwalk because they, there's a, it's a malfunction, mm -hmm. yeah. the paralysis. So sleep paralysis is when you wake up, you become conscious within the physical state of paralysis. So you wake up, you wake up. I, I say it's more like your consciousness becomes aware. And it becomes aware that your body feels really fucking weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. And usually it's a high vibrational state. And so you'll feel a lot of electricity flowing through your body. You'll feel like buzzing, a heavy magnetic kind of feeling. Yeah, and, you listen it. and you hear things too. So you'll hear sounds. It could be a whooshing, a swooshing sound. Some people hear wind. Some people hear electrical buzzing, currents. It sounds like you're tuning into some demonic, weird demonic, radio demonic voices. I, I, voices. I listen demonic, like rock, 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 like a really ancient demonic thing. The, the other and the other way, the other day I, I had one and it was like this voice, blah, 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 like a demo, and I was not scared. And I was actually okay. What are you trying to say? So I was paying attention to I was paying attention to the voice and started pick up pick up some random words, blah, 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 book, blah, 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 this and that. But I was playing with it. And this, like, 10 years ago, it will be, like, the, a very scary moment. So, yes. Good that you're playing with it because there's stuff to learn in it. Mm. Oh, totally. But because we're told to be so scared of these things. Like I said, horror films and stuff, mm. <laughs> paranormal activity, that doesn't help. You, that, that makes us more afraid, right? Mm. All the things in, that we see in the media. Um, so yeah, you'll hear things, voices, yeah, voices in other languages, voices in like, uh, like creepy, mm. you know, whispering. Sometimes you'll hear, um, sounds that are like pieces of music. Sometimes it's footsteps. People hear footsteps in their room or they lots of different sort of mm -hmm. senses of hearing. You'll hear a lot of a variety of things. And then there's the stuff that you see. Hmm. So you feel like your eyes are wide open. So I, I, I liken the um, sleep paralysis as kind of like you're kind of in the astral. Hmm. You, you, you haven't fully disconnected from your body, but you're sort, of, you're sort of on the way you could disconnect if you wanted to. A lot of people don't even realize that they had the option. So anyway, you're looking in your room and you're seeing things in the room so there's the hypnagogic kind of hallucinations that come with sleep paralysis so people will see entities in their room they'll you know some people see something on their chest or they'll see like a witch or they'll see like an old man or they'll see a demon or they'll see an alien or mm. there's a variety of, of of different sort of entities whatever your mind is projecting out into the space And that usually is what really freaks people out because it feels like they're having a ghost visitation or an alien abduction mm -hmm. or, or, or whatnot. So the, having this experience is um, you're trapped. So the, the reason why it causes a lot of fear and panic, it's like, well, for one, it's sensory. So you're feeling your body's buzzing and electricity and you can't move. You're hearing things, demon voices or whatever. You're seeing the demon in the room. And people are like, you can't move, you can't escape. You're just, this thing is happening. Some people are, feel like they're attacked. There's like entities attacking them. And so this is what makes it terrifying because they're absolutely, they feel powerless. They're trapped. Um, and this is what makes it so terrifying mm -hmm. because they're vulnerable. You're usually on your back and you can't escape it. So I teach that sleep paralysis is great. <laughs> <laughs> Because good luck teaching that. <laughs> because, because, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the best thing that can ever happen. Yes. We need to do a, a big rebranding of sleep paralysis. <laughs> sleep paralysis is great, kids. Come on, let's practice it. Um, no, but but uh, but that it's good, like because it's um. Because there's, there's information there and because you're fighting it and you're trying to wake yourself up from it, 
you're missing some valuable messages. Now people will be like, what kind of valuable message is a demon attacking me? Like that's me being attacked, hmm. you know? So it's good to unpack the, these sort of experiences. So, I, so I've guided some people who are like, I cannot see how this would be a good thing. Being attacked is not a good thing. What are you going on about? This is shit, you know? And I was like, well, you know what? I really believe that we all go places we can handle. So if you're having this experience, you can handle it. And you're having it for a reason. So why not go beyond the same pattern where you're like, ah, ah, fighting, trying to fight this thing, trying to force yourself to wake up. And so I teach from the perspective of moving beyond the fear in the sleep mm -hmm. paralysis state and get, and get the message, the eureka moment, which is on the other side of that scary demon face mm -hmm. because there's something beyond it. Yeah. But you keep, you keep coming up against the demon bit and you're not getting the amazing mind-expanding message on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So I liken it a lot to the Buddhist perspective of the bardo mm -hmm. upon dying. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm actually not, any, I'm not really anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really love this concept of the bardo at death and so the idea is that when we die, our consciousness goes through these various, um, goes through the bardo, which is a realm in which we are confronted by like a lot of sort of scary sort of like characters and, and entities. Yeah. So I liken sleep paralysis and kind of the astral to be kind of similar to mm. that concept. So you're having sleep paralysis, you're coming up against this demon that is wanting you to transcend it. The demon is always going to be an aspect of yourself or yeah. something within your realm of yeah. consciousness. So you're going there because you can handle it. You're going there because you can, you can work it out. You can transcend it and find out the deeper meaning behind it. But it's almost like that demon is like, it's an initiation. You got to get beyond that guy. You got to get beyond the fear because it's the fear that's keeping you in the loop of the sleep paralysis. Mm. And you figured it out because you were like, you heard the demon voices. And yeah. Like, I'm not scared. Okay. What, what, okay. What's this? What are you no, trying to and, say? And, and this makes, because that, 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 that experience continued. And, you know, like after the, the voice, I'm, yes, there was an entity in my room and there was like a shadow thing there and it was scary. And it was the voice and I was started, but and then it's like, okay, I'm going to, Try to wake up and I want to I want to face that that entity and I I, I try to wake up with my to move with my no body with my dream body yeah and it was like I, my room become really agitated like this energetic storm yeah <sighs> but I was like almost like a sandstorm I yeah, was walking so walk, walk to the guy and as soon as I get close the shadow was. And I, I'm not making this up. It was me. It was a, a version of me with a tarot deck in the in the card, and I start to show the card. Show me the card that you had. Show me the card. Show me the card. Show me the card. And it was like all this this wind in the room, and then she, she, uh, I show myself uh, the temperance. So inside that storm, uh, it was the temperance. And then I wake up, and I wake up. I don't know subconsciously what healed there, but I wake up like. Like really ex excited, yeah. happy, blissful, and you know, like from this dark beginning, I had an amazing ending, and it felt amazing. That's so amazing, and that is such a beautiful example mm, yeah, yeah. of moving beyond the fear and then having a result. Yeah, that and I, is I, you know, like I, I cannot think to intellectualize what was healed there, but, but was something, something was healed, but I don't know. I I cannot point what. But you know, like I, I got this sense of wholeness after after doing that. Amazing! <laughs> that is so. That's so good. That's a really good example of turning sleep paralysis around and making it uh, changing the script mm. because we're always stuck in the same script mm. of just trying to wake ourselves up. And um, one thing I always try to encourage people to do is realize that you have you have everything you need. To navigate this so you access it so you're in that state of fear and the demons coming you access within yourself a place of no fear and where is that that's love 
you access that love, see that like a superpower mm -hmm. and it's like here in your chest. And I've done this many times where I've been in sleep paralysis and there's entities coming mm -hmm. like ah, coming at me as I access the superpower in my chest mm -hmm. and I beam it out mm -hmm. like it's a superpower mm -hmm. at them and they dissipate. So I've done that. I encourage people to do that. Like, you know, don't feed into the fear of what's coming at you. Beam it with light and love. Move beyond the fear. And also, um, if you're going in sleep paralysis, it's probably a clear sign that you're able to disconnect your consciousness from your body. Mm -hmm. So you could go start exploring the, um, the world of the out-of-body experience, the astral plane and astral projection. Mm. And there's ways in which you can do that, you know, uh, but it does help when you access that superpower of love and not fear. Um, but that's a whole other conversation because that's yeah. the out-of-body experience. Mm. It's yeah. a whole other... <laughs> next, next episode. <laughs> that's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> just, to, just to wrap it up, and you mentioned the dream job and the bardo, bardo tutorial and all of this, um, you know, like, I always was very attracted by your two jo jobs that maybe are just one job because you are a death doula you first you facilitate you are with the people at the end of their deaths facilitating i don't that, kill them but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't facilitate their deaths <laughs> but but yeah, yeah i'm there i'm guiding them yeah and you, them. and you know like all these dream yoga basically as i understand it they say that the dream world is like a test ground from what is coming after your death and they approach as you were saying during all this interview every night is like a practice to navigate that state so the day that i what i'm going to die is like a dream but i don't have a body to come back so they they continue but it's curious that you have these two jobs of two things that are not related uh, that in theory but how that happened And what is in your view, the connection between dreams and death? And what did you learn about these two worlds with your, all your experiences? The two, dreams and death, th they feel very connected. They're both liminal realms. They're, they're both spaces in between, it seems. Hmm. Um, it's, weird. it's unusual that these two realms merged for me and now at this point in my life i can see that they work in tandem together dreams and death mm. whereas as i was growing up in my life the two were on separate trajectories mm. so i had my dreaming world and i was doing my dreaming practice since i was a teenager and then i had this sort of like death path where i was death was very something i was very conscious and aware of as a child um And that was sort of forming alongside. And it wasn't until much later in life that they both merged. So uh, when I was a child, I was um, you know, very aware of, of death and dying. My first person to die was my grandfather. Um, and I remember when my mother sort of told me that my grandfather had died. I, it was funny because I was five years old, but I could tell that she was really like trying to couch around the topic and try to make it like not so harsh mm. about grandpa not coming back. But I, and I, I remember being five years old and looking at her thinking like, she's really uncomfortable with trying to tell me this. Wow. And then also realizing that just being like, yeah, I know, I, I know what death is. And I like, I, I remember feeling quite like, yeah, a matter of fact, very matter of fact mm. about it. Whereas the adults all seemed a bit like, <laughs> kind of skirting around it. And um, I was at his wake, he had an open casket wake. And um, I was touching him, I was like kind of touching his hands and holding his hand. I didn't think it was really weird. Hmm. I just was, I felt very comfortable about it. And I remember like someone giving me a look like an adult, like going like, don't do that. But I was just like, oh, why? It just feels normal to do that. So that kind of at a young age that was sort of around me like my first experiences and then as I was growing up I was always the one like if there was a death in our like around our family or friends and stuff I would always be the one to ask can I go to the funeral <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going with my mom to quite a few mm -hmm. quite a few funerals and 
like fu- like open casket wakes and funerals and stuff where I'm viewing dead bodies, you know, and it's like, oh, it's a great aunt or it's like a second cousin twice removed. Or I mean, some of these people like they were related mm. or they were friends of my mom and I didn't actually really know them personally, but I felt compelled to be in environments where there was like a funeral or there was death. Hmm. And I felt very, um, not because like I was a goth or anything like Mm -hmm. that. It it was because I was obsessed with death or I was morbid. It was just, I just felt like I wanted to see the full spectrum of of human experience. And I I was very, just very curious about death. Hmm. And I wanted to experience these things. And I wanted to know what a dead body looked like. And I wanted to be around people who were grieving. And I wanted to, just felt compelled to, to experience these things. And then when I was like 17, then death started to come into my life in a different kind of way. Um, I witnessed like a really terrible uh, motorcycle accident with my friend, Ren, mm. who I devoted my book to. He died mm. actually too young, actually. <laughs> But um, we witnessed this motorcycle accident and I ran over to help the guy. We didn't move him. We knew not to move him. This was like 1989. And so there was no mobile phones then. So Ren ran and and went to like a neighbor's house to call the ambulance. But I stayed with this guy until the ambulance came and he had died. And it was really like a profound experience because he was like lucid and fine. And then just all of a sudden just went like, it was just, there was no sense of trouble or no, no, he wasn't like having problems breathing. Mm. And it was sort of one of those experiences. I didn't feel traumatized by it, but I guess I was holding his hand, just giving him comfort, like helps on its way. Don't move. And, Mm -hmm. and it just felt kind of like, I felt the energy of the experience, which was, you just, it was so hyper real and so now. So anyway, what ended up happening was like, I'm not kidding, about f- four or five times a year, this kind of thing would happen where I'd be walking down the street and someone would get in an accident like right in front of me and I'd be the first to jump, like giving them help, giving them CPR or like uh, they're bleeding and I'm wrapping up their blood with like a piece, a t-shirt and, yeah. and I'm calming them and, and like literally I could so many times this has happened. It became a long running joke hmm. with my friends where they're like, tree, it's too weird hanging around with you. People are always going down. What's going on? Are you hmm. making this happen? I'm like, no, I happen to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, some of the examples are just insane. Like I was like walking down Carnaby street once and there was a man in front of me and he just like stopped right in front of me. And I just sort of like, what? And then he started like falling backwards and he fell right into my arms yeah. and I cushioned him from falling totally over. And I, I helped him get down to the ground and he was like totally passed out. And I looked, and he had a needle sticking out of his arm. Hmm. He was, like, was walking down Carnaby street, shot heroin as he was walking down the street, Jesus, yes. instantly started, he started ODing hmm. in my arms. And like, we were on to the emergencies and like, they came straight away. I was holding his hands like, don't, don't go, don't leave us. Like, don't leave us, don't leave us. And you know, then the paramedics came, wow. you know, that's just an example, but literally like in fr- uh, happened yeah. to be in the right place. Another yeah. time a guy was under a bus. He was like run over by a bus. It was insane. Like, Jesus. so about like literally like four or five times a year. Um, so no one dying in those times. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what, when I had my Eureka moment, cause this is happening for decades. I was in London walking down Broadway market and I could see that there was this like older kind of heavy set man walking in front of me and I could see he slowed down a bit and he sort of like put his hand on the wall. I went, hmm, that looks like he's, I'm going to go over there. So I I, I was like, hey, excuse me, do you want to sit down? Like, just go help him. And as I was helping him, he just took a, had this huge breath and he just started, his weight just started to fall on me. And it was like, he was a big guy. So Adam came running over. We're helping this guy. He's going down. He's turning purple, like within 30 Mm. seconds. 
and he is just going total like massive coronary like a heart attack mm, yeah. and so we're cpr on him like everyone's taking turns mm. calling the ambulance panic everyone's panicking he's clearly going and i'm holding his hand at one point his his head's on my lap and someone else is just tried doing cpr and pumping his chest and i'm holding his hand going just saying you're not alone you're not alone you're not alone and his eyes are wide open and he's just gazing upwards and there's tears just yeah. flooding down just tears and his last breath just went left and it was just you felt him there felt him gone and this happened like literally under like two minutes it was just like out of nowhere and it just hit me again i was just looking at him going, why does this keep happening right and like the paramedics um came and you know it was too late and they're like trying to liberate him back to life and what happened was his wife his daughter and his child 13 year old child were walking ahead in the market and they didn't realize that he had fallen behind mm. so at one point they're like where's dad where's dad and they came yeah. back to a whole group of people around there and they were they were screaming and wailing and shock and I just like held like his mom his wife and his 13 year old daughter I was just like holding them all while the paramedics were like paramedics bless them like they're they're trained to like no you were going to bring them back to life you know and like it was almost like too long like they were there for like like 15 minutes trying to it was just the family in front yeah it was a little bit traumatizing to yeah. be honest I mean I know it's their job and they're they're like really yeah. trying it's just like take him into the into yeah, the it's yeah. in front of everyone and his poor family anyway i stayed with them all afternoon his family because they were just absolutely shocked and i just stayed with them and offered comfort and for them anyway that night when i went home i said to my partner like i can't believe how many times this has hap happened in my life mm -hmm. like it's so don't you think it's weird like why does it keep happening and he's like i think it's your i think it's your perfume <laughs> he keeps knocking people out i love him he's got he's got such a good sense of humor anyway before i went to sleep i decided to say my <laughs> i just decided to ask my dreams i just set the intent why does this keep happening since i've been a young person a teenager here i am now decades later and it's happened again but like with the death like a proper death in my arms again so i went to sleep I went to sleep dreams and as I was waking up out of dreams, like in the hypnopompic state, mm -hmm. you know, when you get a lot of interesting dreams when you're waking up, it's like mm -hmm. downloads or something. And so when I was waking up, I had uh, like a quick succession of all the times, a connect the dot situation mm -hmm. of all the different times all over the world, because it's happened in Mexico City, it's happened in the States, it's happened in London, everywhere all over the place where I happen to be in the right place at the right time, helping people and people who are very close to death and very afraid of dying. And it hit me like a, a lightning bolt. And it basically was, this keeps happening to you because this is what you're meant to be doing. So I woke up with this Eureka moment and it wasn't a Eureka moment of, Oh yeah, I'm meant to be a paramedic. <laughs> it wasn't that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It's that, 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 that in a way is avoiding this. Yeah, yeah. You're trying to keep them alive. It's not, it's not and I've that. never been a, like a nurse, like a yeah, nurse yeah. type of like you know. Some people feel called to like yeah, cutting open the skin and sewing up. Like no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always been. It's always been an emotional support. So I'm like, you're not alone, and helps coming, and and also being able to hold the space for them, like. Yeah. they're fearful freaked out stressed and so is everyone else around but i'm just like in this really calm zone very yeah. steady and grounded so i was um the eureka moment hit this is what you meant to be doing and so i didn't know if that sort of job existed so my partner suggested why don't you just google like a bunch of different words like emotional support at death so i did that i just tried all these combinations of words literally right when I woke up and I found the death doula uh, movement and I found um, a course here in the UK. It was one of the first things in the search, went to the webpage, read their whole, their whole ethos. And I was like, 
my heart was just radiating going, that's it. I just had this moment of that's what I've been doing. That's what I've been meant. That's what I'm here for. And then it was at that point where the dreams and the death merged together. And I realized that both are the, I've been, both practices need to come together now. And so now when I help people end of life as well, when I'm guiding them, we talk a lot about the dreams. And, and how, how do you come together? Can well, we, we do a catch up. Like, so the man I'm supporting right now every week. So what were your dreams like this week? So we get into the dreams and we um, do some dream work and he's able to see the dream in, in a different light and to look at an aspect or a fear or something that he's sort of navigating and yeah, and sort you, of... You, you think you need to... The, the topics or things that are coming in, in, in the dreams, things that you need to sort out before you, your moment, before your, before your moment of death? I kind of think so. I think um, guiding people end of life, a lot of things come up and it's not usually talked about. We're all always told death is never talked about. Mm -hmm. It's so swept under the carpet, right? So a lot of this is like a big mystery. It's even in a mystery of what your body is going to go through and what your emotions and your psychological aspects going to go through. People don't, we don't talk about it ever, but there's a lot of changes that happen within um, end of life when you're dying. Of course, there's the, the biological aspect of your body actually dying itself, but a lot of people experience ego death, and this is not talked about. And like I said, it's almost more painful than the physical death, hmm. the death of the ego. And I've seen it, and I, I've helped uh, navigate it. Um, what, what, what do you mean that people uh, is really is really painful painful for people to know that? the persona, their ego, their identity is disappearing? Or, or what, do you, what do you mean with ego death in that situation? Yeah, people find it very hard to accept that they're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, that they will be no more. Mm -hmm. And that they were John Smith, the successful politician. Mm -hmm. Or they were Susie Baker, the nail technician. Like, with three kids and a dog and a house and mm -hmm. grandchildren. Or whatever it is, you know? People find it very difficult to let that go and they very, find it very difficult to let go of the concept of themselves go. So they're like, well, I am that person, but, na but now I'm going to die. So what does that make me? That makes me nothing. So I'm, you know, and just those three questions is enough to make people experience a dissolving of their ego and it can feel really painful. So when I say when it feels painful, it can feel emotionally painful. It can feel existentially painful, psychologically painful. People are like, what the fuck am I? Yeah. What was this? And how do you help them in this situation? Like uh, with a lot of compassion, with a lot of listening, active listening, a lot of support in terms of um, breaking things down to looking at the lesser things in life, mm. the smaller things. And that, because, but the, people get there kind of on their own sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm dying, but now I'm realizing it's all about the little things. They always say this. Mm. It's about like just sitting in the park, just watching some, the do a dog playing in the park or feeding the birds. And you know, I know when we're younger, we think, well, that, that's so boring. Why is that what it's all about? <laughs> that sounds like so dull. But this is their way of articulating the aspect of presence. Mm. Because for the first time in their life, that, that, that they're is. feeling they are present and they are aware of the present moment. So it's not the action itself. Oh, I'm feeding some birds. Mm. It's the present moment. The, and like they you, never had that before. What, what, what we've been talking about this interview all the time, you know, you, you started the interview talking about being present to engage with your dreams, and now we came up to the final conclusion that maybe... It's, yeah, and often it's too late in life. Yeah. You know, it's often when someone's given a death sentence. You have six months to live, you have cancer. Then all of a sudden life is just so... Bu because it shocks them awake that they realize... Fuck, I can't waste any more time. I've been worrying about that or it's just like I've not been present with myself, with my loved ones, with my relationship, with nature, with the planet. Yeah. With the planet. Mm -hmm. 
and often it's too late. So that's kind of how I na navigate uh, people suffering ego death. Now you don't need to be dying in order to experience ego death. You can ha you can have it at any point in life. Some people have it um, because of some ma major shakeup in their life, and they can experience it. You can have it through psychedelic experience. You can have it through death to a loved one or lose your job. It could be anything that triggers it. Um, but you notice that when people do have an ego death, they seem like they're more present. <laughs> yeah. And if they're, um, I mean, if they're present in a way, they, they will be happier, no? Because happiness is in the present moment, right? Not, not, in, the, not in, any other, in any other place. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is this one, they're like, to learn how to die is to learn how to live. Yeah. And they also talk about meditation as the practices, practice of death. Um, a lot of the things that you've been saying today about dreams and all of that, you know, like it's about being present and about not being in the future or in the past. Or And now if you're saying that people at the end of their life, that this is what is karma, is that's the realization that it was about that. Yeah, and they realize that it was about that the whole time. And often you'll hear things like, I wasted time. Why did I waste time? Mm. I should have kept up that relationship or I should have been in touch with that person more. And there's a lot of like, the regrets are often of that nature. Mm. And the regrets aren't, I wish I made more money. Mm. I wish I owned a big, huge company. I wish I had more medals. Like, mm. it's not that. It's never that. Mm. That's the way you pretend it. And you know, like in a in a twisted in a twisted way, that behavior of not being present and the things that you you, you are not going to remember when you are dying, like your fortune, the things your growth, the things that you get in life. You know, like that's the mentality that is also killing this planet, this continuous extraction and not being present with us. So you're solving two problems at the same time. <laughs> or problems and the, I mean, it's the same problem because we are nature. It makes sense yeah. when you see it, but it's like, for me, it's a bit of a, it's, I'm, you know, like it's a wake, wake up, you know, like this is, this is what we need to do, not only for us, for the planet. And, you know, like that's the solution. There's the solution, solution. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it starts with a shift in consciousness. Mm. That's where it's, it starts with getting back to that inner world and, and becoming more present with the outer world as well. Part of the death doula practice is that you reflect on your own death quite a bit. And through the training, we did some amazing sort of exercises in which we were really brought to look at our own death. We planned our own funerals. We sat and contemplated our own death in a meditative state for like an hour. Um, we wrote ourselves letters. Uh, we, you know, what we would tell ourselves um, after we had died, you know, all these really interesting sort of practices. So basically every single day I reflect on my own death and, and it's not in a morbid way. It's in a just a realistic way. Like I'm going to die. One day I will die. Um, what are you going to do today in order to make this life meaningful who are you going to help who are you going to make laugh who are you going to help heal what are you going to put out what are you going to give um basically it makes you live better reflecting on your own death makes you live better so also when i fall asleep at night i think about death it's like what i think about when i'm falling asleep i think about like you know it's almost like a training like falling into your sleeping uh, body. Sometimes I, I'll, I'll lay there and think, okay, I'm dying, or this is this may be what it's like to die, and just surrendering to it, um, just having a peace and a calm about it. Again, like I'm, it's not morbid. I don't have a death wish. You know, I'm not suicidal. Yeah. It's just real. It's just reality, and it's just embracing it. Just going, death, you're my friend. I will work with you. And also, like, I'll be here as long as I need to on this planet, you know? And, yeah, it's sort of like making death your friend and not being afraid of death, not, not being fearful of death. Um, so that's, it's a really important part of my practice now. 
it's it's mixed in with the dreams too you know with the dream work mm -hmm. um but i find that it it really makes a difference to how i live mm -hmm. you know so some it's so, like simple things you know when sometimes you hold back on a decision yeah it could be something simple like um you're standing on a dock and there's a beautiful lake in front of you it's a bit cold out but you're so you're kind of like if you were in a dream, a lucid dream, you'd probably be like, amazing, I'm going to jump in the water. Mm. But then, like often in, in waking reality, we don't. We just go, uh, uh, no, now I'll yeah. just look at it. Sure. Well, jump into the water. <laughs> and I do, I do stuff like that now. Yeah. Where I'll be like, no, I want to experience this. I want to jump in the water. And I did it in like Norway in this like really cold mm. black fjord. And I was like, I don't care. I, I just, to be in a black fjord water of Norway would be amazing. You only, you're here once. Let's do it. So things like that, when you, when you reflect upon death, you, you embrace life more. You realize that. You don't waste time. Like, this is here, I'm going to experience it. I'm going to do this. Now, I'm not to say, like, you can take that yeah. to extremes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like... And some people do, you know, it's like, you only live once. I'm just going to get a crack yeah, habit. Yeah, I'm going to smoke yeah, crack. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so, you know, you could, you know, we're all free. We're beings of free will and choice. We can take it to <laughs> in a positive way or a negative way or however you want to live your life. That's the beauty of, of this dream that we live in. We have, a ch we have choices we can make. So yeah, that's my reflections on death. We did. I think we're going to end up to finish it there. That was amazing.